Momentum is one of those concepts in physics that actually agrees with your common experience. For example, something that has a lot of momentum would be something like a truck driving really fast down the road. Well, what are the two parts of that that make up its momentum? We know that a truck going very fast has a lot of momentum, but what does it have? It has a lot of mass and it has a lot of velocity. So that's what momentum is. It's nothing more than mass times velocity. Well, the symbol for momentum is a lowercase p, and I put the little symbol for vector over the top because momentum is a vector which means direction matters. So the direction that the object is traveling, its velocity, means that its momentum itself has the direction that the velocity has. The units, we just take mass, kilograms, velocity, meters per second, and it's just called the kilogram meter per second. It doesn't have a, have a name. So let's look at a couple of different examples. Let's say we have a truck that's parked and we have a ladybug that's crawling along the ground at 0.1 meters per second. Which of these two would have the greater momentum? Now, the truck has a great amount of mass, but because it's parked, its velocity is zero. So its momentum, even though it has more inertia, its momentum is zero. So the ladybug would have more momentum in this case. Let's say we had two runners that had equal mass but one is running faster. Well, if they have equal mass, but this one's running faster, then this person has more momentum. What about two objects that have equal velocity, but have different masses? So here we have a truck that has a great deal of mass and a little car that doesn't have much, but if they're going at the same velocity, then the truck will have more momentum. But the place where these problems get tricky is when the, each of the values are different. So for example, we have a truck that's moving at 2,000 or 10 meters per second and has a mass of 2,000 kilograms. The car has a mass of 500 kilograms. How fast would it have to go to have the same momentum as the truck? Well, we know that it would have to be faster but how much faster? So to do this, we just say that the momentum of the truck has to be equal to the momentum of the car. So we would say MV of the truck equals MV of the car. Well, the truck is 2,000 kilograms and its velocity is 10 meters per second and the mass of the car is 500 kilograms and we're solving for the velocity of the car. And that value comes out to 40 meters per second, which makes sense. It has less mass, so it has to go faster. Conservation of momentum deals with problems where we have collisions, where one object is colliding into another, and maybe they bounce off of each other, or perhaps they stick together. But in either case, the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after the collision as long as there's no net external forces on the system. So as long as nothing's pushing on the system from the outside, then the momentum before equals the momentum after. And we're going to start out by doing this in one dimension and then we'll get into two dimension collisions a little bit later. So we say that the momentum before of the system Okay, so this is the system, that's everything in the system, has to equal the momentum after of the system. Does not say that the parts have to be equal. So the way we write this equation is we say m1v1, the momentum of the first object, plus m2v2, the momentum of the second object, has to be equal to the momentum of the first object plus the momentum of the second object after the collision. Now, it could be a collision. It could also be an explosion. For example, like if we had two blocks with a spring and they went flying apart, or we had a rifle shooting a bullet, the, the rifle recoils, the bullet goes this way. Okay, those are the same problems. This formula still applies for those. So let's look at this system here. We're ignoring friction 
So does the block exert a force on the second block? And the answer is yes, but nothing outside of the system is pushing on it, creating a net external force. So are there net external forces on the system? No. Are there forces on the bodies themselves during the collision? Yes. So we can say P before equals P after because there's no net external forces on the system. So let's go ahead and solve this problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the velocity after the collision. So let's write out our formula. M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. So the first thing we have is the first block. So that's 6 kilograms times 2 meters per second plus the second object, which is four kilograms times zero meters per second, so that's going to drop to zero, equals the momentum of the second object and the, uh, the first object and the second object after the collision. But this after the collision is gonna have the same velocity. So if we have m one v prime, we'll call it for the new velocity, plus m2 v prime, and these are equal, then we can factor out the m1 and the m2 to give us m1 plus m2 v prime. Now, why is this true? It's because this is acting like one object. It's acting like a 10 kilogram object. So on the other side of this equation, we can put these together and say 10 kilograms times v prime. It won't be one or two, it's just whatever it happens to be. So on this side of the equation we have 12, and on this we have 10. So v prime comes out to 1.2 meters per second. Now let's look at this answer for a second, because one thing that we have to think about is what's going to happen after this collision. Well, it's going to hit and momentum has to be conserved, so it has to slow down. More mass, slower velocity. Also, we can look at this. 6 times 2 is 12, so the momentum of the system before is 12. What's the momentum after? Well, that's 10 times 1.2. That's also 12. So P before equals P after. Let's do the problem that we did before as a derivation. So we have block M1 traveling along at V1. We have block two that is at rest. They collide and stick together. So this is going to be M1 and M2. And the, this little drawing here, this is like Velcro. Or sometimes they use, they say, clay balls that stick together. But we'll just go with Velcro. So what do we say? We say M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. So the first, uh, second object is at rest. So that goes to zero. So now we have m1v1 equals, and these velocities are equal, so we can factor out the m's. So we have m1 plus m2 all times v prime. Dividing both sides by m1 plus m2 gives us v prime is equal to m1v1 over m1 plus m2. Now, if you can do this problem, you can pretty much do any conservation of momentum problem in one dimension. So let's look at this. We have a four kilogram mass that is going to crash into a two kilogram mass. So they're moving in opposite directions. Then after the collision, the two kilogram uh, mass takes off at three meters per second. And we wanna find out What's the velocity of this mass? And also, what direction is it going? Is it going to bounce off of the two? Or is it going to keep moving in the same direction as the two? Now remember, we said that momentum is a vector. So we have to take into account direction. So let's write our equation. We have m1v1 
plus M2V2 equals M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. So M1V1 is going to be 4 kilograms times 4 meters per second plus, but then it's going to be 2 kilograms times a negative 2 meters per second. So what I'm going to do is rather than put in 2 times minus 2, I'm just going to put in minus 2 kilograms times 2 meters per second equals M1V1 prime, so that's 4 kilograms times V1 prime, plus 2 kilograms times 3 meters per second. So what that's going to give us on this side is 16 minus 4, so that's going to be 12 kilogram meters per second, is equal to, on this side, we have 4 V1 prime plus 2 times 3, that's going to be 6 kilogram meters per second. So if we subtract through, that's going to give us 6, and 6 divided by 4 is going to give us V1 prime as 1.5 meters per second. Now notice this came out positive. So what does that tell us? It tells us that this is traveling at 1.5 meters per second to the right. So let's go back and look at the system again. We know that 4 times 1.5 is 6. So this side of the equation is really 6 kilogram meters per second plus 6 kilogram meters per second. So what's the momentum of the system before the collision? 12. What's the momentum of the system after the collision? 12. P before equals P after. We're now going to look at four different situations, and we're going to use a formula that you don't need to know, but it's instructive so that you can see what happens. Now, we haven't done the energy unit yet, so you're not, you don't have to worry about these terms elastic and inelastic. It has to do with whether energy is conserved, not momentum. But you can think of elastic for now as bouncing. So we're going to have this mass come in and hit this other mass, and it's going to bounce off of it perfectly. Now, we're also going to say that the masses are exactly equal, maybe 10 kilograms and 10 kilograms. This one comes in at V1 initial, and this one's at rest. So the question is, what's going to happen after the collision? Well, there's these formulas here. Again, you don't have to know these. Don't worry about these. But let's just look at what they tell us is going to happen. Okay, so V1 final, the final velocity of this, is going to be equal to m1 minus m2. Well, we know that m1 and m2 are equal, so that's going to be zero. So what's the v1 final going to be if all of this is zero? It's going to be zero, so m1 is going to stop. So what's m2 going to do? Well, this formula tells us what the other one will do. So we have 2 times m1, and we know that m1 and m2 are equal, so this becomes 2m1. So 2m1 divided by 2m1 is 1. So the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity of the other object. So what's going to happen? Well, this is important. This one is going to go off at the same speed as the other one came in at. In other words, if the masses are equal, when they collide, the first one will stop, and the other one will gain the velocity that the other one had. But what if we have a situation where the collision is with a small mass colliding with a very, very, very large mass? So I wrote this as M2 is much greater than M1. And by saying much greater, we're saying like this is one kilogram and this is a hundred thousand, like massive. And this one's just sitting at rest, and this one comes in at V1 initial. Let's look at what the formula says. Well, it's going to be M1 minus M2. 
Well, this is so small, we can treat it to be like zero, and this is just gonna be a really, really big number. So if this is negative, a really, really, really big number, and this is gonna be zero plus a really, really big number, then that's just gonna be a really big number minus divided by a really big number positive, which is just gonna be a negative velocity. So what does that mean during this collision? It means that M1 is gonna bounce off just as if it hit a brick wall, and it's gonna bounce off and leave at exactly the same speed that it came in at in the opposite direction. Well, if this is supermassive, what's it going to do? Well, we have 2m1, that's basically zero because m1 is so tiny. So this becomes zero. In other words, m2 will effectively not move. Let's look at another bouncing problem where this time we have the much more massive block collides with the little tiny block. The little tiny block is at rest and the very large block comes in at V1 initial. Well, in this case, we have a very, very, very massive number for M1. This is effectively zero and this is a giant number plus zero. So we end up having M1 divided by M1 which just gives us one. In other words, this block is gonna just keep plowing along, and that should make sense. It's not gonna slow down much just because it collides with this little tiny object. So its final velocity is gonna be equal to the initial velocity originally. But what's the second block gonna do? What's block two gonna do? Well, 2m1, so this is a giant number times two, M1 is um, very large, so this is gonna be a giant number, and that's so small it's effectively gonna be zero. So we have two times a giant number divided by a giant number, so that's gonna be two. So what's this gonna do? It's gonna move off at double the velocity that the other one came in at. So this one comes in, collides with it, it basically just keeps going, but this one shoots off at double the velocity. What happens in this case, where we have two blocks with Velcro, they're approaching each other, they have the same mass and the same velocity. This is kind of surprising because it seems like they would have some momentum in their system. But remember, the momentum of this one would be mv plus, and this one has an equal mass and an equal velocity, but in the opposite direction, so that would be minus mv, giving this a total value of zero. So what are they gonna do when they collide? Their final velocity will be zero. They'll just stop. If we have two objects collide in an elastic collision and both of their masses are equal, the first object will come to a stop during the collision and the second object will gain the velocity that the first object had. If the first object is much, much, much more massive than the second object, then the first object will carry almost all of its velocity. It will slow down a little tiny, tiny bit. And the second object will gain double the velocity of the first object. If the first object is much less massive than the second object, then when it hits the second object, it will rebound with exactly the same velocity that it came in with. The second object will essentially be at rest, although you can see it moves a little bit. If the first object collides and sticks with the second object, then their masses combine, and their combined velocity is less than that of the velocity of the initial particle. Lastly, if we have two objects with the same mass and the same velocity, but they're traveling in opposite directions, the momentum of the system is zero. So when they collide and stick together, they stop.
These are very common physics questions. So I'm only going to do one type, which is two carts of unequal mass combined by a spring. And what happens is the spring is compressed and then the spring pushes them apart. Now remember, for every force there's an equal and opposite force. So the spring can't push on the six any more than the spring pushes on the four. So these forces are equal and opposite, but that doesn't mean they have to have the same acceleration. They both get the same force, but because this has more inertia, it has a smaller acceleration. This has a smaller inertia, so it has a greater acceleration. So we would expect that this one's going to go faster. Now this type of problem I think of as an explosion. There are many different versions and they can dress these up in different ways. Uh, one very common way of doing it is saying a cannon shooting a cannonball. So this would be our cannon. Our cannon would recoil. In other words, the cannon moves back and the cannonball moves off this way. The more massive the cannon, then the less the cannon will move back compared to the velocity that the cannonball gets. This could also be a rifle and a rifle bullet. Again, they would call this recoil, or sometimes they might use the word kick. It's kickback. It's the amount the rifle moves backwards when the rifle bullet moves forward. And lastly, sometimes they'll do two ice skaters. One, a massive ice skater, and they push on a less massive ice skater, and they both move off. So we're going to use the same formulas that we've used before, which is P before equals P after. So we're going to do M1V1 plus M2V2 equals M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. Now, we got to be a little bit careful here because when the system is at rest, nothing's moving. So our first side of the equation is six kilograms times zero because the initial velocity is zero. Then we have four kilograms times zero and that's going to be equal to the other side, which again, we have to be careful because that's six kilograms but two meters per second to the left, momentum is a vector, plus four kilograms times our V2 prime. So this whole side of the equation just drops out to become zero. So we have on this side, negative 12 plus four V2 prime, and then bringing the 12 to the other side and dividing through by four, that's gonna give us 3 meters per second. It came out positive. As we would expect, the cart would move to the right at 3 meters per second. So, again, we just have to be careful to understand this idea that the momentum of the system before was zero. The momentum of the system after the explosion is also zero. And look at why. What's 4 times negative 3? Uh, sorry, positive 3. That's positive 12. And what's 6 times negative 2? That's minus 12. So the right side of the equation is 0, just like the left side. But when you solve these problems, I highly recommend doing a shortcut method, which is to think of it this way. Since they start at 0, that means the momentum of this cart going this way has to be the same as the momentum of this cart this way. In other words, these two momenta have to be equal to each other. They're in opposite directions, but the magnitudes have to be equal. So the shortcut way of doing this is to ignore direction and to just say mv equals mv. And so we can say 6 times 2 equals 4 times v. And that gets us the V of three meters per second. Just be careful because you have to know the directions of your objects.
What happens when we have a collision between two objects, but then they split off into angles, and now we're dealing with two dimensions? Well, the same rules have to apply. The momentum before the collision has to be equal to the momentum after. But when we start out, what kind of momentum do we have to begin with? Well, we have m1 v1 initial, but that's x information. So the total momentum before the collision is m1 v1 initial, but that's x. Then the collision takes place, because we're saying this is at rest, as before. So the collision takes place, and then m2 goes shooting off here at some angle theta 2, and m1 shoots down here at some angle theta 1. Well, was there any y momentum initially? Well, this was not moving in the y direction. This is at rest. So the y momentum initial is 0. So what does the y momentum have to be after the collision? It also has to be 0. So that means the momentum of m2 up has to be equal to the momentum of m1 down so that these cancel each other out. Well, how do we figure out these momenta? Well, this right here is going to be the other side of our triangle. So that's going to go with sine because that's our opposite side. And this one is also going to go with sine because that's our opposite side. So these two sides are going to be the m1 v1 times sine theta. But what about in the x direction? Well, in the x direction, we have the adjacent side, which is going to be cosine, and the other adjacent side, which will be cosine, and these two have to add up times their momentum, mv, to the momentum that we started with. So let's look at the formula we would have m1 v1 initial, that's the momentum that we start with, and that's in the x direction. This is a way that is kind of common to write it, the sigma, which means summation. Sum up the x's, sum up the y's. So we sum up the x's, we have m1 v1 initial to start, then we have m1 v1 final cos. So that's going to be this component right here or that's the m2, so it's going to be this component right here. And then we have our m2 v2 cos theta 2, so that's going to be this one. And those combined components are going to be equal to the initial momentum in the x direction. Now in the y direction, there was no momentum initially, so it's zero. So we have m2 v2 final sine theta, because now we're dealing with this, but the m1 version of it is down, so that's negative, so we need a negative sign in here. So what does this picture look like after the collision? This is going to be the components of m2 v2 up and m1 v1 down. And what went with those? Well, those go with sine. And the two components that are equal, uh, they're not necessarily equal, that are going in the positive to the right direction, those are going to be the ones that go with cosine theta. And the sum of these two have to be equal to the initial momentum in the x direction. Let's go ahead and solve a problem with numbers. So we have a 5 kilogram mass traveling at 10 meters per second. We'll call this M1. And it cruises along. This could be like a pool ball hitting another pool ball. And it hits a second mass also of 5 kilograms. And this M2 goes off at 6 meters per second at an angle of 53 degrees. The initial ball cruises down here at an unknown velocity at 37 degrees. So the question is, what's this unknown velocity? And we're actually going to do this two ways so that you can see the big picture of this. Let's start by doing the sum of the momenta in the x direction. And that's going to be equal to m1 v1. And then we're going to have our m2 v2 
and we want the x component, so that's going to go with cosine. And then the other one is also to the right, so that's going to be m1 v1 also cosine theta except that's going to be the 37. And then if we put our numbers in, we have 5 kilograms times 10 meters per second is equal to M2V2, so that's going to be 5 kilograms times 6 meters per second times cos 53 plus 5 kilograms times V unknown, that's what we're solving for, times cos 37. So if we do the math on that, we have uh, 50, and I believe this comes out to 18, and this comes out to plus 4 V1 prime. So that gives us a V of 8 meters per second. But we could have done this another way. We also could have done this in the y direction. And I think it's very important to understand both ways because they may give you a problem which you can only use one direction or they only give you enough information to do it in one direction. So that's going to be summing the momenta in the y direction. And that's going to start out as zero. Now, why? Well, because this only has momentum in the x direction. It's not moving up, it's not moving down, and this one's at rest, so it has no y momentum. Then, we're going to take the m2v2 sine theta 1, okay? That, or, well, we'll call it sine theta 2. Doesn't really matter. Um, and that momenta right here is going to be in the upward direction. So we're going to call that positive. But the second one, our M1V1, that's going to be M1V1 minus sine theta 1. So we put our numbers in and we have 0 is equal to... 5 times 6 times sine of 53 minus 5 times our V unknown times sine of 37. And we do the math on this. We can add this to the other side and solve for V. And if we do this, we get a V of 8 meters per second. So in this particular problem, we can do this to solve for v by doing either the x or the y direction, but they may not give you enough information to solve for this in the x or the y, or perhaps you'll have to do both equations and solve for one variable.